thank you very much for being here tonight and I am honored to be inaugural speaker for the program and for both for the center and for Islamic studies. Um, I'm also fortunate to occupy a very respected chair in Islamic studies donated by Triple IT. So I have now built a bridge between several um, good people who can make a difference in the world in which we live. My interest in biomedical medical ethics is very much part of this engagement with contending modernities. Modernity has put a lot of pressure on traditions that have been long struggling to define their parameters. One of the areas in which we find traditions are engaging modernity is biomedical ethics. We never thought that we would be able to take off biomedical ethics, not only in Islamic tradition here, but also encouraged it in Tehran, in Jeddah, in Amman, in Muscat, and many other places. This is a new field in Islamic studies. So far, even in the Western studies of biomedical ethics, the subject is not more than 40 years old. We've been struggling to describe and to prescribe methodology of how to understand, how to make decisions that are so pertinent to human existence. And I'm talking about human existence, human life, as it begins and as it ends. Because both at both these, there's a kind of spectrum from the time an embryo is formed and the time when we determine the soul has departed from the body. These are religious concerns, by the way. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, they all are dealing with these questions. What is new is engagement with secular bioethics. So far, the field has been dominated by secular bioethics. So colleagues in Catholic bioethics or Jewish bioethics or Christian bioethics are now willing to say that we have something to contribute and engage our colleagues in secular bioethics. After all, what we deal with is all existential. What we are dealing with is the existence of human beings. How do we see the life in front of us? How do we determine what life is worth living? How do we determine that this is the time, the time has come to abandon all the efforts and endeavors medical teams are making to keep us alive and to say, enough is enough, I need to go. Those are the moments that we want to explore tonight. And I want to underline something very important, that the language is very universal. Because it is the language of suffering. It is the language in which we are dealing with pain. And we have no solution for it. But there is no cure for it. We are simply prolonging life. We are simply dealing with the issues as the families put pressure on the medical team. Healthcare providers, insurance companies, everybody is involved in making those decisions that are going to touch our loved ones. Maybe our parents. Maybe our own children. In other words, it's a topic that is, that I call full of humanistic aspects in which we all human beings participate in different ways. Islam is, in many ways, a belief system that is very much concerned, like Judaism, in the concerns of the community. Jewish ethics is communitarian ethics. Autonomy always takes a back seat in Jewish ethics. My colleague David, David Novak always tells me that we share something very common with you Muslims 
and we the Jews because we are looking at an, at an individual connected with a community. We don't see individual hanging alone in an autonomous fashion the way the modernity is saying. But we see an individual connected with the community, with the family. And therefore, any decision we make about an individual has implications for the family, for the community, for the society as a whole. We're also talking about distributive justice. How many resources do we have to spend to keep someone alive on machines? This is what we call extraordinary intervention in prolonging life. Medical team today do not want to give up very easily, rightly so. The profession is such where if a physician were to give up on a life, it would hurt him. At the end of the day, he or she would say, I have lost a case. My patient has died. Therefore, all the efforts are being done to keep the patient alive. We ask this question in a culture in which death is welcome. By the way, in Muslim culture, death is not an anathema. Death is always there. And you face it. Therefore, you find that in the Muslim funeral ceremonies, children are running around, women are there, everybody's there. In other words, it's not kept something away from the children, that they should not see it, they should not know it. Rather, they are participants in everything. The fact is that the culture is very much informing religion and not the other way around, by the way. We might think that in every aspect it is religion informing the practice. But in ethics, and this is, I think, the theme of this year, of these lectures, that we are dealing with ethics. When we deal with ethics, we are talking about human relationships. We are talking, talking about something that is extremely important to keep that human community together. We are talking about global community. We are not talking about only one particular community. In other words, we are talking about ethics. We are talking about moral concerns of the people to the people. And we are engaged in alleviating suffering of one another. We are engaged in responding to the loneliness of the people, especially the old people who are in nursing homes who are waiting to be visited by their families. This is the culture that modernity is faced with. We can't avoid it because we have to meet those, people, those engagements and they are part of our moral responsibility. Even if it is not dictated by religion, we still feel rationally connected and we feel that it should be done. What we are about to discuss tonight is the interplay between religion and culture. And the reason I say that is this. Bioethics is a new topic in Islamic studies. We are still struggling to define its methodological parameters. So far in the Muslim world, they have translated Western medical bioethics and taught in the hospitals. So far, Malaysia, Indonesia, even Saudi Arabia, Iran, they are teaching biomedical ethics as it has been defined by secular bioethicists. In other words, there is already a set way of moving in the clinical situations for the Muslim physicians. And this is the secular way to do it. What we are discovering now is, in Tehran, as in Jeddah and some other places, they are now trying to search for specifically Islamic principles of problem solution. This is where my role becomes extremely important. I have been among those bioethicists who have insisted that Islam has its own principles, which can also speak to the secular bioethics, because there's a human, human dimension to it. And since there is human dimension to it, we can now talk to one another and we can sit in conversation. In other words, I can sit with David Nowak, I can sit with my colleagues. Jim Childress or somebody else who are all working in the same field, there was a time we could not talk to one another because we were depending on Islamic scholars to tell us how to make a decision. And those decisions were given in the form of a decree, in the form of a dictum. These were the fatwas. 
Now for the first time, we are empowering our physicians. We are telling them, you can make your own decision. Provided you understand the human suffering. Provided you understand your own responsibility and recognize your own limits to help your patient. How much can you do it? So we are there to help you out. In other words, we have now workshops in the Muslim world where we train Muslim physicians to say that you don't always have to open a book in order for you to understand what am I required to do morally. I'm a Muslim physician. I'm a Jewish physician. I'm a Christian physician. What should I do? Because I do believe in my own religion. I do believe in God having the power to give life and take away life. What am I supposed to do? If somebody comes for, for abortion, should I perform it or not? These questions are real questions in the medical field. Insurance companies are also determining whether those decisions can be made by the physician or not. My concern is to show you that there is a universal idiom to which we are responding in biomedical ethics. Ultimately, it deals with human pain, human suffering, human aging, and human need for one another. We cannot live without one another. We always need one another, and that's the reality of human global family. Different cultures need one another. In other words, we are really looking at the very important idiom that the beginning and the, and the end of life are coterminous in providing universal experience of humanity. If you are a human being, then you will suffer something. You are going to leave this world. You are going to leave your family. Your loved ones will mourn for you. That's a reality. How are we going to deal with it? My colleague in the University of Southern Methodist University is studying a very important subject, funeral services. What are the funeral services? Who are they for? They are for the living people. The person who is departed, he doesn't need any service, doesn't need any ceremony. But we who have lost our loved one, we need a service. We need something to sustain that lost. And therefore, the funeral ceremonies, that anthropology itself is worth looking at. But here I'm more, you know, concerned about showing that what a religious person might go through. There's a life as a preparation stage and for death and the hereafter. There is hereafter. This is what the Abrahamic traditions are teaching. And therefore, we see that funeral rituals in all cultures reveal the universal dimensions of human longing to remain connected with the loved ones and cared for in the moments of pain and separation. This is a universal idiom. Life cycle unveils moments of self-realization. Who am I? Becomes obvious in those moments when I'm departing, when I'm leaving everything that belonged to me once and I just go away. And that long, lifelong journey towards the discovery of one's origin. To this Quran says, Inna lillahu wa inna ilayhi rajiun. To God we belong and to God we shall return. But look at this. Look at this. The way Rumi, the great mystic, has captured this separation and longing. That the story of human being is all the time, you love someone and there is a separation. You live with someone and there is a separation. In other words, it's the reality of human life and we all long and we all suffer the pain. What does Rumi tell us about it? As Listen to this read. How it tells a story complaining of separations, saying, ever since I was parted from the reed bed, my lament has caused men and women to mourn. I want a bosom torn by severance, by separation, that I may unfold to such the pain of love desire. Everyone who is left far from her source wishes back the time when she was united with it. Which source are we talking about? Our divine source, from where we came at one point. We want to go back to it. In other words, all who hear the mournful tones of the reed flute respond because they know the same sorrow of separation from their divine source and their longing to return to that source. 
This is a universal dimension of what I'm discussing, what I'm trying to understand. Because my under, I work as a chaplain in the University of Virginia Medical Center. I worked as a chaplain. And I went to console patients who were terminally ill. It's a heartbreaking experience, by the way, when you work with this situation, where the family members are trying to save the person who has, who has experienced stroke or something, and they're trying to keep him alive. The physicians agree, they don't agree among themselves. And here is the family supposed to make a decision, what shall we do? It's very interesting that I don't go only for Muslim patients. I'm called for Christian patients. I'm also called for Jewish patients. I'm also called for atheist patients. Because the language is universal. When you go through pain, when you are suffering the separation, when you are afraid to leave everyone behind and go away. This is what I'm talking about. That It's not something that I cannot experience or you cannot not experience. Life then is a story of separation and from an union with one's source. And this is what we struggle with in the end of life decisions. We want to remain connected. This is our goal. We don't want to be disconnected. How many times we wish all human relationships will, you know, continue forever and ever. There's an institute of longevity in California. People don't want to die. They want to live. They're searching for those genes that can really propel your long life so that you can enjoy your life with your loved ones, with your wealth, with everything that you have. And yet there is a reminder all the time that no, nobody lives forever. Now, that kind of understanding in biomedical ethics creates a very distant and I think very interesting scenario in clinical ethics. What exactly should we do? Moments of affliction through illness demand intense demonstration of connectedness. You ask me when I go to the hospital, when, there's no, when the patient has no family members, no one to visit him or her. What happens to that patient? And that's why the Prophet of Islam said, visiting a patient in the hospital is seeing God. By the way, that is also repeated in the New Testament. It's part of New Testament. That's why you see God. Because you go and see and console the suffering person. In other words, that's the kind of experience that you get working in the hospital. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to inject, interject here what I call my personal dimension because I don't want to appear only as an academician interested in giving you a very clear cut structured you know presentation whereby you can say well this was you know methodologi methodologically a very good presentation this is how we should be going. I'm, I want to add this human dimension with which I'm confronted all the time. I have patients for whom I fly to Toronto every month. I have patients for whom I, tra I travel to San Francisco every other month. In other words, I am part of that group who can somehow, you know, negotiate the space between this separation and union. How exactly should we do it? So we are talking about modern lifestyle. Why is this problem so severe today? It was always there in Tanzania where I come from. It was always there because there were people dying, but they were all connected, you know, they were always at home. My grandmother ill, almost terminal ill, has cancer, she's at home, everybody's around. In other words, there was no loneliness. You were always connected with people. Modern lifestyle is open to criticism, where human relations should become diluted because of the demands made by the artificial pace of, pace of busy love. We are always so busy. I'm talking about my, re my, my own children, by the way. We brought them up with love and care. They don't have time even to call once a week. They're very busy. But if you look at their life, analyze it, you find that, no, 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 they're not really busy. I tell my son, Muhammad, are you really busy? Not really, are you? And he confesses, yes, Dad, I know I'm not busy, but I'm, I'm careless. Now, are we dealing with this whole situation then? Is it a modern lifestyle? Is it a modern demand? Our individualism, our, our you know, self-imposed loneliness. We don't want to connect with the people. That's a major issue, by the way, when you are dealing with the terminal ill patient. Who is there to accompany that person? 
University of Virginia hospital system is constantly saying, who is coming with you when you have a surgery? Who is there with you? Will there be someone to be with you at your side? Will I be able to talk as a physician to someone if, there, if your life is in danger? By the way, they tell you that out of 1,000 patients, one dies with this medication that we are trying to experiment on you. They tell you very openly, I'm a heart patient. I have a pacemaker. They tell me all the time that, you know, we are, trying, we are, we are experimenting. We don't know what the result would be. They make me sign the paper, though, so that I don't sue them tomorrow. But, but that's beside the point. The point is that they want someone to be there with the patient. They don't want to leave the patient alone. And I think that's what we are really trying to bring in religious faith. What does religion teach us? Abrahamic traditions are based on ethics of relationship. We are supposed to connect people. Moses came, according to, the, according to Rumi, to Barai Vasli Ahmadid, not Barai Fasl. You have come to connect people, O oh Moses. You haven't come to divide them. And Moses is responding, God help me to connect them. This is Rumi talking about, about Moses. You talk about Muhammad, you talk about these prophets. They've come to relate people. And this is the tragedy of today, that we are not relating people, we are not connecting people. And I will tell you that there is this awareness today in the universities. There was the last, I think in, it was in the month of November, we had this suicide awareness week at the university. All students and faculty were connected with the religious studies, were all involved because we were talking to our young people that there is meaning in life. You don't have to kill yourself. In other words, we are dealing with the end of life decisions. Are we capable of doing it? Are we, are we really, do we have right to death to make those decisions? This is what I think the Prophet of Islam, very interestingly, gives premium to the life without illness. In one of the beautiful traditions is that he's telling this person who has died how fortunate you are, that you died while you were not afflicted with illness. You died while you were healthy. In other words, you died a good death. A good death is in good health. And therefore, there's a lot of emphasis, by the way, in the prophetic tradition that all Muslims must train themselves horse riding and, I don't know, swimming and archery. In other words, sports, in other words. That in order for you to keep healthy, this is what you need to do. But this is true, you know, in the teachings of Abrahamic tradition. These prophets in the Hebrew Bible, they were horsemen. They were in the command of their armies. They were fighting in the armies. In other words, in other words they were in good shape, so to speak. They were not in their bed. They, I, I don't read about any prophet dying in the, in the, you know, as ill on the, on the deathbed. You know, they were always struggling and striving. And this is very interesting and powerful. The religious communities are now adding a dimension to secular bioethics. They're putting a human face to secular bioethics. They're saying, no. There's human dimension to decisions that are made in the clinics. Clinics cannot avoid looking at the human relationship. So value is, at, at, is attached to the healthy life in Muslim culture. True. Illness is regarded as an affliction that needs to be cured. Here we have a very interesting scenario. How do we understand suffering? Do we accept it? Or do we regard it as something evil that should be rejected? The general consensus among Muslim scholars is that it is a test from God. Illness purifies you. It also functions as expiation of your, you know, of your sins. All these things are connected with this valuation of what is happening as part of the divine plan. The goal of medicine then is to search for cure and provide necessary care to those afflicted with disease. This is interesting conclusion then in the first part that physicians are not required in religious systems that I know of to prolong life. They have to recognize their limits that we have done enough and we now we leave it. Instead of feeling bad about it, they should be willing to accept the limits. And this is something that is not in the hospital culture, by the way. Because hospital culture, healthcare culture, is usually agno agnostic, if not, you know, anti-religious. 
And therefore you find that there is this enormous confidence, I can do it, I can cure my patient. And that kind of confidence, religion comes and says, please wait a minute. Can you think for a minute? Can you really save this life? Are you sure you can do it? This is where we come to understand the guiding principles in Islamic ethics. This is part of the Middle Eastern Studies program, by the way. And one of the major components of Middle Eastern Studies, in my opinion, is going to be religious studies. Not only Islam, Judaism, Christianity. They all are religions in that part of the world. And all these communities are living with one another. If you go to Jordan, you go to Israel, you find people living together. Whatever we think about, the way they might be divided, but there they are willing to talk to one another. I get emails from, you know, from Hebron, from the hospital. Sometimes it's a Palestinian hospital, you know, Palestinian uh, physician writing. Sometimes it's a Jewish physician writing. Says, what exactly is the Islamic situation about it? In other words, we are really looking at the guiding principle of ethics in Islam. There's a correlation between reason and revelation in terms of ethical guidance. Islam says what God teaches you is not different from what you understand through your reason and through your moral sensibilities. There is correlation. If God says, be kind to your parents, so does reason say, be kind to the one who is your benefactor. Somebody who has taken care of you. It's now your turn to take care of them. In other words, there is this connection. The dichotomy then between religious and secular are non-existent, Peter. Islam has, has it accepts for its own as a default measure that there is religion on one side, but there's also secular on the other side. It is default because there's no church. Since there's no church, there's no clear division between state and church. The division that we find is between seminary and the state. That is the source, the power of the learned, the power of the jurist, so to speak. And it's not the power that, is, that comes to them through ordainment. It comes through the knowledge they have. Therefore, you find that secularity is inbuilt in the Islamic tradition. And I can argue and I can prove to you that that's the case. I'm not making it up. In other words, it is a controversial point, by the way. If I mention this in the Islamic world, there would... They will say, no, 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 that's not possible. You are making it up. I said, no, I'm not making it up. It is there. When the Quran does say that there, there is no, whatever you do in this life, there is something that you do because you are human beings. The moment you bring human equation, then you are talking about the world that is not dominated by your faith. It is dominated by your commonsensical morality, your decency as a human person. And that's what guides you. So that, you know, dichotomy is absent. Professional ethics then is geared towards protecting individual's well-being within the familial and communal context. It cannot simply pay attention to the individual at the expense of the family. So it's very interesting that I was working in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia in the hospital and I was I was surprised to see that in most cases there were surrogate decision makers. The family made the decision about the patient. Patient autonomy was not respected, by the way. I felt, as an American, you know, coming there, I said, this is not right. The patient should be asked. There should be what we call informed consent of the patient. But it wasn't there. The family were making decisions as if the, fa the patient was making the decision. In other words, surrogacy was a real authentic surrogacy. Well, we don't accept that very easily here. Man, I... I have advanced directors in the in UVA hospital system, but those advantage, advanced directive system can be really overturned by my wife, according to the hospital. If, the host, if my wife comes to the hospital and says, no, I don't agree with my husband's last wishes, no. I think this is what I need to do. And the hospital will listen to her. In other words, she has autonomy and she has a right to do that, by the way. To overturn my wasiya, so to speak. Say, no, I don't want to follow what my husband says. In other words, we do recognize that. And I think that what we see as a very important element, even in the Jewish communitarian ethics, is family, community. You have to keep them together in order to assess the needs of an individual. Individual is not, you know, self you know, controlling 
uh, individual who can make all the decision on his or her own. I want to come to the very, uh, I think, important issue that all religious systems are worried about. And we don't have a good answer. Honestly, we don't have a good answer. If you ask why children suffer, there's no theology that I have seen any gives any satisfactory answer. Why do innocents suffer? Why do civilians die? Warfare takes place. There's violence taking place. Civilians die. You know, there's destruction of innocent life all the time. We see it. And there's a question that is really burning in all our, you know, conscious. And we are, we are asking, how can that be possible? How can we tolerate this thing? In other words, there is a question about how do we handle our body? Do I have a right on my body? Can I donate parts of my body? By the way, this is connected with the last end-of-life decisions. Organ donation is a major issue. It's not only an ethical issue, it's also a legal matter. Can I ask for a prize if I, give, if I donate my kidney? Somebody needs my kidney. I have daughters who need to get married. For them to get married, I need to spend a lot of money for their dowry. If I don't sell my kidney, how will I pay for their weddings? You're talking about the culture in which those issues are extremely important. So, the United Nations, the WHO, they found there are cert certain countries in the third world, they are selling kidneys. And there is exploitation of the poverty. And it's very dangerous. But wh when does that happen? A very interesting bo book by Shirin Hamdi, for example, she talks about organ donation in Egypt. How Egyptians are handling the black market, black market of the kidney donation. Who is selling it? Who is buying it? In other words, there is an upheaval. And this is what I call the moral tragedy of regarding your body as your own. Is this your own? I think Shirin Hamdi's subtitle is that my, God, my body belongs to God. It's not mine to make a decision about it. I have a stewardship of it. I really don't own my body. I can't really do anything about it. Yes, I, you should, there are issues that we will... I, it's not a subject of tonight's talk, but we can discuss perhaps the, what ex when exactly can I donate any part of my body. Merely we are caretaker. The real owner is God. This is what Islamic tradition is. So suffering then is a form of a test and trial. To confirm a believer's spiritual station. Where have you reached? How easily you accept it? Surely God will try you with something of fear and hunger. And this is what I think the Quran is reminding us. So suffering then is purposeful. It's not evil. It functions as God's purposes for humanity. When would you realize what you don't have? And when would you thank for something you already have? That's what the suffering does. It has educational purpose. It has the purpose of showing us. So human decision to end suffering, is it allowed? Naturally not. Can I decide to terminate my life? God's immutable decree is revealed in law. This is the Sharia, by the way. Where... Not only the right to die is not recognized, the right to be assisted in dying, whether through passive or active means, euthanasia, is also ruled out. In other words, we have no such authority to make decision about it. What if I start, if the physician starts me on a machine, intravenous feeding, and keeps me alive through a ventilator? Is there a time when I can determine this, this is causing me more harm than benefit. Can I make a decision? Now the new decisions that have come out from other places, Cairo, including some other places, they're saying that in that situation, if three physicians testify that your treatment is not working, it's all futile, then you can, you can sign the paper that they can turn off the machines. But this is still disputed. In Pakistan, it would not be accepted. Because the religious authorities have not condoned this right at all. They say, no, we have no such right. So different countries have different authorities making the decision. In other words, we are waiting for the collective decision by healthcare providers, including attending physicians, 
the Saudi men of religion have ruled that if the men of medicine, that is, if the physicians give you a certainty that no treatment is going to work, then it is all right to discontinue intervention. You can stop the ventilators. You can stop these machines. In other words, as long as no harm is made, no harm is done to the patient or to the system, we can say that it is possible to withdraw life-sustaining treatments. I want to conclude very quickly here, and I don't. Know, I really want to, to give you a chance to probe me further because I've, I've put so many controversial issues in front of you. But I want to. I want to sum it up. That if you work in the hospital, if you work with the physicians, then you can say that everyone is dealing with a moral dilemma. And the moral dilemma is the sanctity of life. If I do, I have the right to stop and end to it. Can I say, it's enough, I don't want to live anymore. Can you tell your physician like that? Should your physician listen to it? There was a woman, woman patient she suffered from pelvic cancer in Amsterdam. And she went to see this doctor, Dr. Sharif. He was a Muslim doctor in Amsterdam. So when she went to see the doctor, her husband and her brother, they both came with her. Cultural requirement, by the way, that she could not see a male physician without companions, without male, what we call, chaperoning. So the husband and the brother were there. The physician insisted that he wanted to talk privately to the patient because that was, that was the Holland system, Dutch system. But the man did not leave. What was the problem? The problem was this, that the woman had already indicated to the doctor that I want my life to be discontinued. Please give me a little injection because I can't live alone in my home when there is no one to take care of me and my husband and my brother they are working all day and I'm all alone at home. I'm talking about human desperation and that kind of situation is very tough. It's easy for me as an academician to say let your husband die or let, let your wife die. But it's very difficult for the family members to really digest such a decision, even if the patient is really ill and cannot have any chance of being cured. Your loved ones are your loved ones. Even if they are in the bed, in the hospital, even if they can't move, even if they can't move their eyes, you still want them. In that case, who makes the final decision? Can the family make a decision? Can the patient make a decision? This is a moral dilemma that we are faced with today in the modern life. In the old days, this question was never discussed because a dying person was always surrounded with family members. Not anymore. In Toronto, not anymore. In New York, not anymore. It's a family, nucleus family, husband, wife, children. Extended families have gone all separate, living separately. Therefore, there's no chance for them to receive any kind of support. I'm talking about the human dimension of the moral dilemma. I hope one day we can rebuild the relationships that have been so much diluted with the challenges of living a modern life. Thank you very much.